Thanks. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. Um, you spoke about um, David Johnson's credibility as being a, a real farmer, and um, hopefully you won't take the fact that the only useful thing I've ever done in my life was breed really big fruit flies <laughs> and hold it against me. Um, it's, I'll only say one more thing about breeding fruit flies. It reinforces a point that David made about how you can pretty much select and go on selecting and be effective kind of forever because um, I think I did something like 35 or 40 generations of selection in my uh, PhD studies and the trend lines were still at the same, going up at the same rate at the end as they were at the, at the start and there's absolutely no reason uh, not to think that that couldn't apply to anything you want to change about Hereford cattle or indeed any combination of things that you might want to change about Her Hereford cattle. It's, it's one of the most remarkable things about genetics and it's, it's really just up to, to us how we use it. Um, John asked, or John on the board asked me to come along and speak to this title um, after I had some discussion with them at, a, at an earlier board meeting. I think you're going to find that some of what I have to say uh, overlaps with, I hope reinforces, messages that David's already touched on. Um, obviously not exactly the same way, but um, Please don't be disheartened by the fact that you'll be hearing some things the same from David and myself. It's really just a function of the fact that, um, and we kind of worked on these, these uh, presentations independently, it's because people who think hard about where your breed is and what the opportunities um, in front of you are, and do it from a sort of genetics background, are going to see quite a lot of similar things as being the real big opportunities and the real big challenges. So. I think it's it's just going to reinforce some stuff, but to me that just highlights the importance of, of what we've both said. So what I'm going to try and do is work through really quite a simple uh, talk. In fact, I want to start by just saying a little bit about the current situation for the breed um, from my perspective, then say a little bit about what I think genomics might offer you. Um, then go on to where the BIN project fits into it. I'll call it BIN, Beef Information Nucleus Project. Um, we can talk later about why they're called that, but I'll call it the BIN project, and it's the, it's the Hereford Progeny Test. And I want to finish up with some opportunities and some challenges um, for the breed and for individual breeders. And I'll, I'll kind of say right now that both the opportunities and the challenges are really, really big. You guys are not in a good situation but you've got a huge amount you can do to fix that. Um, and if you remember nothing from this talk other than that, and that you need to get on as a breed and working with your board and so forth, um, if you remember that, that will be the most valuable thing that I can convey. Um, in my role in MLA, I get, I get very good statistics provided on uh, breed plan uptake from people like Andrew and Christian. It's part of how we monitor the investment that's made with your money in uh, MLA. And one of the things we can track is how many cattle are going through breed plan from all the different breeds. And to me, that's a proxy for market share. And the first point there tells a pretty significant story. Basically, over the last 20 years, Hereford and Angus have swapped their market share. Um, and it, it's virtually that clean. Um, and that's because of lots and lots and lots and lots of factors. But when it's all said and done, you've swapped market share with, with Angus cattle. <coughs> Part of what's contributed to that is that uh, the breed has made less progress than its competitors over the last 20 years, about 20% 20 less progress on index than the average of the southern breeds, by which I mean Hereford, Angus, Shorthorn, uh, Murray Gray. So Herefords have made progress in dollar index at a lower rate, and even though they've accelerated a bit in the last five years, it's still slower progress than in that last five year period than your major competitors. And when you drill down to the trait level, you realise something really quite important is that there's been almost no change in marbling in the breed and almost no change in fertility. Now, you can argue about whether Hereford should marble or not, but marbling is one of the things that determines consumer demand for beef. and your breed hasn't changed your marbling in 20 years and fertility is one of the big drivers of your customer's profitability 
like the people who buy bulls off you, and that's pretty much flatlining as well. So you've changed things other than marbling and fertility. I suspect it's mainly growth rate. Um, but those two key drivers, nothing's done, nothing's happening. And the last point, because ultimately, as I'm going to explain in a minute, what you do in genetic progress is completely and utterly determined by how much data you've got. You've, you've got a reasonable base. Um, there's about 20,000 animals a year performance recorded in the breed. I think that's a combination of Australia and New Zealand. Most of them would be Australia. So about 20,000 animals to work with, getting some sort of records each year, but only about 5,000 of those are getting the uh, scan traits or carcass data. So if you want to do something about those traits, you haven't actually got that much raw material to work with. And as you'll see when I start talking about the genomics, that's, um, that's pretty much the, uh, what you've got to pay to play in the game. So you, you, you're not sitting in a situation where you've got oodles of data to, to help you out. So I think that's a fairly challenging situation. Clearly Hereford used to be the dominant breed in much of Australia and over the last 20 years you've lost that position and I believe one of the things that's contributed to that is considerably slower progress than at least some of your competitors have made and ultimately that comes down to uh, the selection decisions, what sort of things you've been breeding for and what sort of volume of data you've got to do it with. So, okay, what can we do about it? This is a really simple statement of, of what Hereford bulls are going to have to do if you want to do something about that situation. It's really, really simple. They've got to deliver more money to your customers than any alternative. Mm -hmm. And the dollar index, which David spent some time uh, outlining, is a really, really simple measure of how much money your bulls are delivering to your customers. That's exactly what it's designed to tell you. It tells you the value of the bull's genes in overall profitability traits. The higher that value, the more money you're delivering to your customers. And it's really simple. You've got to do more in that regard than your competitors. And in the future, you've got to improve it faster than your competitors too. David touched on the point about, I think you're making $2.40 from memory, and I think you said 1% per year. In simple economic terms, what you're delivering is 2% improvement in poverty per year because the terms of trade go down by about 3% per year. So if you're delivering 1% improvement, your customers have got to do something else to make up that 2% difference or they're going backwards. <coughs> right? And I think David said, it's quite straightforward to double or triple that rate of progress. And if you can do that, you're actually giving your customers money. You're improving their wealth situation. It's as simple and black and white as that. I shouldn't say black and white, red and white as that. Okay? So, for the Hereford breed to rebuild its market share, you've got to deliver more value to people who buy bulls from you than any alternative, and you've got to improve it faster than you currently are. And ideally, significantly faster than the terms of trade. That way, your customers are actually becoming wealthier, and they'll come back to you. Really simple. So, the fundamental uh, proposition here then is we've got to deliver more value, uh, more profit to our customers, and we're doing it through genetics. There'll be other things that contribute to, the, to their wealth, but what we're here talking today about is doing them a favour by delivering them valuable genetics. And genetics is actually a pretty simple sort of investment proposition when it's all said and done, because all we're doing is we start off with some data the things you record on your cattle, and we convert it to information. The data, and once we've got the information, information is in the form of EBVs and dollar indexes, once we know those things about the animals, we can disseminate the good genetics. We can spread them as widely as possible, and then the commercial producer, and the, the feedlotter, and the butcher, and so forth, all these other people can harvest the wealth, and you'll get a payback for that. So it's a really simple story. We start with some data to identify animals' genes. So we convert that into information, EBVs, the dollar index, 
and then people start harvest, they spread it and harvest it. And in an, in an information sense, or an investment sense, I'm sorry, what you'd really like is to spend as little as possible doing this and this, and spread this as widely as possible. That maximises profit for the whole system. The steps in this are very, very simple. Data is basically collected from breeders, although someone asked earlier about collecting data back from the feedlot or the, um, the processor, and that's something that needs to be included, but basically it comes back through the breeder. So the breeder invests to collect data. We then convert that to information. Genetic analysis is just another word for breed plan, but that's some clever maths that turns raw data into information. And then once you've got the information, you can say, right, this is a good bull to breed lots and lots and lots of progeny with. And that's what I mean by dissemination and harvest. Okay? So it's a very simple investment story. We start by spending some money here, spend a little bit of money to turn that to information, and then we start harvesting the value. And the, the overall challenge is what's the smallest amount of data we can transform into maximum potential wealth. And it's worth thinking about this both as an individual stud breeder, but also as participants in a brand. Hereford is a brand. It's kind of like a car company. You, your customers sell the ultimate cars in a sense, but you generate the cars. What you do generates what's actually going to be shipped out to the consumer. And if you think about the Hereford value chain in its simplest terms, most of you, I would suspect, are people like that. And you're trying to maximise the number of customers and spend as little money as possible doing it. So conversion of data to, to uh, wealth is really important. Now, how is genomics going to help us do this thing? Because that's kind of where the bins come into it. And some of this has already been touched on, but it's worth really, really thinking hard about this because you're going to be bombarded with information about genomics. You're going to be bombarded with tests, <coughs> products, and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's worth hearing this story many times to try and tease out what the real facts are and what you can do about it. The great thing about genomics is, and when we say genomics, what we really mean is taking a hair sample or a blood sample on young animals getting that read through extremely expensive machines, which I can't describe to you, but it may tell you that the DNA makeup of the animal. Emily's going to be talking about it later on this afternoon. But basically it's a hair sample or a blood sample or something. The DNA is extracted and it's read to work out the animal's genetic makeup. That's what we mean by genomics. What it offers for people interested in cattle breeding, more than any other thing, is the ability to evaluate animals' genetic merit in very young animals. And, and there's no question people could do it in day-old calves if they wanted to right now, okay? So this business of, potentially, this business of waiting till the bull is 18 months or two years or older than that old before you decide whether they're any good or not just goes out the window. In principle, you'll be able to make decisions about which animals to keep for breeding, which animals to sell, <coughs> at day old. I don't think that would be very practical, but you could do it in four or five or six months. And so that's a stunning change to the way things operate now because you don't have to hang on to animals, your cost of production of bulls goes down and so forth. And it's particularly important if the test conveys some information about something that would otherwise be very hard to measure. So most of you I'm sure must be uh, recording weight traits your weighing cattle, that's relatively straightforward to do. You've got to have some facilities and so forth to do it with, but it's reasonably easy to do. And genomics may not offer very much advantage in that case. But in the case of a trait, let's say, like eating quality, um, when people do MSA testing and so forth, what they're trying to do is they work out the juiciness and the flavour and the tenderness of the meat by, you know, how hard is it to cut through it and stuff. I defy anybody to work out how to do that on a live bull. Um, I don't want to be near you when you try, by the way. Um, you just can't do that. It's very hard to measure. Similarly, good records on reproduction are not easy to get anyway. So if you've got a test that you could put on a three or four or five month old bull or heifer 
that tells you something about their genes for eating quality or for fertility, then all of a sudden, a lot of hard work has been taken out of the equation. And so that's a really, really attractive prospect. And that, I think, encapsulates what, what genomics um, potentially offers for us. Currently, as David showed you with those prediction equation accuracies, genomics in beef cattle is operating at moderate levels or low to moderate ac uh, levels of accuracy. I've got up there about 25% accuracy for dollar index. I suspect that's slightly on the high side. There are some traits for which we're hitting about 40% accuracy. That's equivalent to an EBV having a 40% accuracy. Um, that's not as high as we'd like it to be, but it's a fairly simple problem to fix um, because we just need more data. We need more data where we've recorded the animals and we've measured their, read their DNA, put the two together and worked out how those two things relate to each other. So the accuracy of genomic tests is basically just determined by how much data we've got behind the test. So that's kind of good, except the data is um, not free to get. The other great thing that I think genomics offers, and I've sort of touched on it, is this one here, simplicity. Because once the tests are at a level of accuracy that um, a breeder is, is happy to work with, you quite literally replace all the recording effort with nothing, with just a blood test. And I reckon some people are going to take to that like ducks to water or you know, whatever expression you want to use. Because it's hard work. You, you people have spent a lot of time learning how to keep records and, and get good quality records and you know that not everybody does it very well. And some people are going to take to genomic tests and say, you beauty, I don't want to have to do any of that ever again. And once it's at the right price and the right accuracy, people will take that option, I'm sure. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So genomics, what's genomics likely to offer? First of all, the, the ability to identify animals' breeding values very, very young, which allows us to speed up breeding programs. We'll be able to measure or to estimate their genetic merit for hard to measure traits that are, are currently not recorded very well, if at all. And thirdly, it's very simple. You take a hair or a blood sample. So, just a couple of quick points on that um, flowing on from it. It kind of looking like it's going to settle out at about 20 to 50 bucks a test. Um, I think uh, one of the tests on the market now is in the high 40s. Um, an interesting point which I'll come back to is we're not very far from the day when the genotyping part of that might only be 10 or 15 dollars, but the other part of that cost will be the cost of the data, and that's going to be something that the breed is going to have to work out how you handle that, and I'll touch on that later. But I reckon 20 to 50 bucks is a reasonable <coughs> estimate of what it's going to cost within a couple of years, if not already. And uh, the last point I've got here, the targeted use of animals. If, uh, for instance, you want to make sure that Hereford breed uh, can provide animals to that broad range of environments and production systems that you saw in David's last few slides, like snow in Montana to, I don't know what they call it out in the central desert, but it didn't seem to me there was anything to live on. But, but that huge range of temperature and amount of feed, you want to be able to cover that range, that's a perfectly reasonable strategic goal for the breed. But for instance, if you want to be able to sell bulls to people who want to put their cattle through feedlots, they will have to have marbling. They'll have to have higher levels of it and do it really efficiently. And so it might be worth being able to find the bulls that can do that and deliver them to those specific supply chains. So that's what I mean by targeted use of animals. That's sort of available now through breed plan, but this will kind of supercharge that option. What are the risks around genomics? Um, I think it's fairly obvious that uh, one of them is there'll be tests made available and you have no idea what they actually tell you about the cattle. That's what I mean by uncalibrated tests. That's not English, I know, but well, it is English, but it's not ordinary English. Uncalibrated tests means a test where you haven't got a clue what the test result means. And um, I think we can be absolutely certain there will be tests like that offered on the market. Those of you who um, read about human genomics, we'll know that that sort of thing's going on quite widely now in the States and I think probably here. Fantastic tests being offered, you know, find out whether you're related to Neanderthals or whatever it might have to be, and nobody's got a clue whether the test works or not. 
that's quite literally the case. So the first thing is people offering tests, let's say for Hereford cattle, and you don't actually know what they're telling you. And the second, which I think is just as important, is that the breed doesn't develop the capacity to find out whether a test does work or not. Because in order to have calibrated tests, someone's got to have calibrated them, and it will depend ultimately on you people whether that happens or not. It's not going to happen magically because MLA thinks it's a good idea, so they'll pour a few million bucks into calibrating tests for Herefords. They might be interested in it, but they're not going to do it on their own, I can assure you. So that, they're not quite the same thing, these two. This is just having tests on the market from Joe Dodgy, and this is that your breed doesn't have any capacity to work out which tests work or not, right? And you probably can't do a great deal about that, but that is completely in your control. And the other risk around genomics is that what I just said about uh, how easy it is potentially going to be, you know, take a blood sample or a, a hair sample on a young animal, send it off to a lab and, and pay you 50 bucks or whatever, and you get a result back, you don't have to do any performance recording. Well, I reckon a lot of people are going to find that really, really attractive. And depending on what proportion of people do, you might end up just not having any performance records or not enough performance records to do this thing because that's what I ultimately depend on. Um, so I think this is, this is a serious risk for the beef industry as a whole and it's a serious risk for your breed and you kind of need to start working out and thinking about if the tests were $20, would anybody record any traits? Because if they do, if that was how it turned out, there goes that one. You're out of the game. So genomics is kind of really bewitching, sort of seductive thing, really, when you think about it. But like all moral tales, it comes with considerable sting in the tail. Um, it's very, very attractive, but it's not free. And I've talked about this calibration thing. How many sort of, what, what do we need to be able to, to calibrate a test? Well, some very clever people have worked on this, this question. And it comes down to a fairly simple sort of rule of thumb that for reasonable, workable accuracy for tests for most traits, you need to start with about four to 6,000 records. It depends a bit on the heritability of the trait that you're talking about, but four to 6,000 records gets you a test that'll be somewhere up around the 50% accuracy. This is accuracy up here. This is number of records across here. And this, this area is kind of, um, sort of the sweet spot, I suppose you could say. So to get a test to work at around, say, 50% accuracy for the traits you're interested in, you're probably going to need about 5,000 recorded animals, and those animals will have had to have been genotyped as well. And so David talked a bit about the, the work that's been done in the CRC population. So uh, all the data from a bunch of different projects was accumulated together, and, and Agbu and others done lots and lots of analysis. Um, I'm not sure there are too many traits for which that level of data uh, was reached. I suspect there weren't too many. But the other problem was that we didn't have that many records for any individual breed. And currently, at least, genomic tests aren't working across breeds. So you can't sort of sit back and assume the Angus will get these tests working and you'll just be able to piggyback off them. Because it won't, there's no guarantee at all that an Angus test will work in Herefords. So, this is kind of the rule of thumb. You need four to 6,000 records for whatever trait it is um, on animals that have got the record and the genotype in order to make a test work pretty well. Now, you don't have to do that every year. It seems like you need about that on the current population. And so as a rule of thumb I'm working on, you need to add to that about 1,000 or so records each year. Basically to keep this topped up. It's kind of like keeping the fuel fresh or something. So that's what we need for calibration. And you remember at the start I said you guys are recording about 20,000 animals a year, maybe 30, and you're getting about 5,000 animals that are measured for the uh, carcass traits. Um, that 5,000, if they were all being genotyped, would get you that sort of accuracy in one hit. So we're not talking about something here that's going to be simple for the Hereford breed to get into, because you just don't have the volume of recording at the moment. Okay. So, let's look at um, reference populations or bins, which is, is 
what the key point of my talk is about. Um, here I'm calling it reference population, but you can see beef information nucleus projects or bins. This is an initiative that MLA has taken with a number of breeds to actually start the process of accumulating the data, particularly for the hard to measure traits, so that we can get genomic tests that we're confident work. And these have been running for about three years, uh, I think in all cases. Angus Hereford, Limousin Charolais Brahman and Wagyu has now got a, a project as well. In each case, uh, it's a partnership between the breed and a, a, a part of MLA, so it's 50-50 funding. And it's trying to start the process of collecting enough data, and I'll show you how much data there is in a minute. In all cases, all these projects, with the exception of Wagyu, I won't talk about that anymore unless anybody wants me to, but in all cases they're running as progeny tests, where a bunch of basically young elite sires have been sampled. In total is about 85 bulls a year, 15 a year in Herefords, and they're very intensively recorded, and I've tried to capture that in this slide. Um, you can see, I'll look at just Hereford, there's about 400 progeny per cohort or per year coming through, and they're getting growth, carcass, and eating quality traits, and they're getting female fertility traits as well. So the, the heifer progeny is being retained and they're being joined, and they've, they're calving performance um, assessed. There's three of these bin projects where there's both the steer traits and the female traits, Angus Hereford and Brahman, Charolais and Limon are just, Limousin are just looking at the slaughter traits, or basically the growth and slaughter traits. And you can see the size of the projects. These two are about 360 progeny each, Brahman about 600 a year, Hereford about 400 a year, and Angus about 1,000 a year. So um, the bigger this number, the better. Um, and I don't think it's any secret that these guys want to increase the size of theirs. And I think Jeff just told me uh, Hereford are looking to increase the size of yours, and you should do that. Now, getting back to the um, my original challenge, remember converting data into information that you can use to generate wealth. Um, one of the issues that floats around this thing of genomics, because at the right price, people will stop recording, you've got to have to start thinking about incentives for people to record. Because otherwise, you're going to have what I've, the economic term is free riders. <coughs> I won't pick on individual people because I don't know you well enough, but there'll be, I'm sure there'll be a few people in this room who quite like recording and will be prepared to keep doing it. And there'll be others who'll say, you beauty, I'm out of recording as fast as possible. I'll just <coughs> use the test. Well, the people just using the test are free riding on the people who do the records, however the records are collected. And I, I'm not having a go at error for breeders here. Exactly the same problem exists, will exist in all other breeds. And it's going to be really, really fundamental how you solve this. David touched on, uh, we will, Agri will be very happy to work with, with the Hereford breed to work out different options to solve this. And in MLA, we've, we've started some projects to look at this as well. But this is a really, really fundamental question. You must have the data to underpin the genomic tests. And some people will have to spend money to get that data. And other people will be just using that data. The sort of numbers, I reckon, once you've got your, your 5,000 up to start, it's going to probably be about 1,200 50 or so progeny a year recorded, so I reckon you need to get your bin up about twice the size of it currently is, if you can. And the breed as a whole, having made that investment, has really got to start hitting its straps for the rate of genetic progress. David was talking about doubling in 10 years. If, you, if that's all you do, your market share won't move. It's as simple as that. I reckon you've got to get it up over six or seven dollars per cow per year just to stay in the game. Um, and part of it, and this is outside of genetics, but it's really important, is just sensational customer relationships. You're investing, you will be investing an increasing amount in having a really well-defined, really state-of-the-art product. You've got to make sure your customers know how to get the most out of it. It's no good just selling them a bull and hoping they, you know, make a bit of money or feel happy about it. It's, it's, it's about making sure they capture as much profit as possible of what you've delivered to them. And that's quite a different relationship from what most people currently do. And it's, it's going to be more challenging in the genomics era than it has been to date 
because there'll be more features of the animal that could deliver profit. But people are going to have to understand each of those features, such as marbling. How do I get the money back out of the marbling that I've just bought from you via that Hereford bull? The other thing which I think is going to be important, um, and I'll touch on again in a minute, is because your numbers are limited currently, you've got to look at every possibility of getting other data that can help make genomic tests work. The bin on its own, and certainly at its current size, is not big enough. And so it's worth finding out whether the American data collection can help you, assuming they'll cooperate, whether the Irish data will help you, assuming they'll cooperate. Anything that can help you get that volume of data up quicker is important. The, uh, I just really want to stress a couple of points about that. <coughs> At least 1,250 progeny recorded per year for the hard to measure traits, I reckon, is, is kind of what you need to get in the game. And I cannot stress this strongly enough. Without that sort of activity continuing, you simply <coughs> cannot have a DNA test for those traits. The only way you could make progress if you don't have that is if a few people do record and do make some progress and you'll be buying their bulls. If you want to make progress for marbling and you're not doing it in a bin, you're going to have to buy marbling from someone. So it's, it's really important to go out of this session this morning understanding that you simply cannot have a DNA test unless someone has done the recording on relevant animals. Um, I've already said this about the bin needs to be bigger if possible. If you can get, the faster you can get up to that sort of 5,000 um, base level, uh, the better. You're going to have to start thinking very hard about whose data contributes to the reference population. You don't have to get all the data from a bin. There'll be some people who are doing recording, for instance, for fertility or growth traits really well. Their data is worth gold as well. So there'll be a combination of the bin and some really good recorders, they will be the data that underpins your breed and you'll work out which animals are the best ones to genotype. I've touched on the American story, only two slides to go to. Um, in recent correspondence with one of your members, uh, we touched on the question of what are sometimes called young sire programs and um, the idea was conveyed that BIN is basically a young sire program. Let me just explain what this is. If this is complete gobbledygook, I won't take very long over it. We'll get on to something more interesting. But it is an important point because it feeds into how the breed works as a whole. The BIN, the progeny test, is not the same thing as a young sire program. The young sire programs that have offer, operated in Angus and are quite widespread now, in particularly the meat sheep industry, um, a young sire program is where a bunch of people use usually a team of really high merit young sires through AI across a large number of herds. So there might be, say, 15 or 20 people co cooperating and they construct a team by identifying some young bulls or rams and they all use a bit of each of those rams. There's various ways you can do it with bulls. But the key thing about that is using a, as many young sires as possible across those herds and making those animals as high on merit as possible. Usually people pay a lot of attention to the trait balance, so you know, don't just get them because they're good for growth rate or and hopeless for everything else. You try and get uh, even balance of the EBVs across the traits and make them as young as possible um, because the faster you get them into the game, the faster you'll get them back out again. So that's what a young sire program is and it typically involves just ordinary people who are running studs doing some matings by AI and the AI will be a package of half a dozen or 15 or so bulls. So you're spreading those bulls tests across uh, quite a number of herds. You're spreading really good young genetics. You're testing it very quickly. Where the bin helps is that some of those bulls should be in the bin so they're going to get the hard to measure traits measured on them, like eating quality, for instance, because I don't think that's ever going to be easily done on the farm. So a young sire program and a bin could work together in fact, it would be very smart to make it do so, um, but they're not the same thing. So if I haven't explained that to the person I was in correspondence with, we can have a yarn about it afterwards. They're complementary activities. 
and they both ultimately lead to more genetic progress. So to finish off, um, I want to start my, my last slide by saying you're completely free to take any of this technology on or none of it. It's, nobody can force any of you to do anything here. It's a free choice. Um, it's a free choice whether you make faster genetic progress or not. It's completely up to you guys. But unfortunately where you're not free is to control the behaviour of your competitors, either other beef breeds or pork or chicken or dairy who compete with you for land use. You can't control their behaviour and they're getting into this technology as fast as possible. You've given them, you've been very generous, which is one of the nice things about Hereford Breed's contribution to Australia. You've been very generous by letting them have plenty of time to get a bit of a head start. You know, presumably they're hopeless, so you need to give them a head start. But that's what's happened. You've given <coughs> other breeds a head start in using breed plan, and you've pretty well placed your genomics, but leave it too long and they'll have a a head start which could easily be impossible to catch up. So you're free to do whatever you like. You don't have to use any of this technology. You can keep on doing what you do now. It's You're not doing a bad job. It's just that other people are doing better and they are making choices that you do not control. So I, I think you're in, a, it's a pretty challenging situation. Second point I'd stress is without a bin and some excellent recording herds, you will simply not make any progress for hard to measure traits. For things that you can't measure in your studs, you will not be able to make genetic progress. You might be able to import it, either from America or from other breeds through the back door, but one way or another you'll pay through the nose for that because people are realising the cost of getting the data to, for instance, have a marbling genomic test. It costs a lot of money. You've got to record that 5,000 animals and top it up and people are not going to give that, that away anymore. So, to my mind, the answer to the question I was given is a bin is actually essential if you want to make genetic progress for anything that you can't measure on your farms. It's as simple as that. Um, and to finish off, um, I reckon you guys are already behind the eight ball. You've been marking time for 20 years. Um, Genomics could actually be the end game for Herefords. There's no question about it. it this, I'm not just picking on you. It could be the end game for a whole bunch of other breeds as well. It could be the end game because other people pick it up and run with it and just get out of sight. Or it could quite literally be the start of a new era. And it would be quite a, a new era in a number of different ways. One will be more and more people buying unbelievably good Hereford genetics because they like having the choice and it's a, it's a good fit to their operation and they like the cattle. So there's plenty of possibilities there. But it's also going to be an, a new era in that to get into this game, you're going to have to operate as a group more effectively than, and I'm not, <coughs> this applies to everybody too, I'm not saying you haven't operated as a group um, and others have. Any breed that wants to be successful in this era is going to have to work together within the breed in ways that nobody has done before. There'll be things that individuals can do and there'll be things that have to be done together. And um, people like myself and, and David and obviously Christian and Andrew, very helpful, uh, sorry, we are very helpful, but we're very keen to help work through what the options might be. There are no easy answers to this. People are working this stuff out all over the world. But if you can crack that, the right combination of what the individual does and what people do together, you've got an unbelievable future. Thank you.